A very warm welcome to our Green Ambitions Golden Opportunities Sustainability webinar for GSK today. Um, I would like to welcome our speakers from GSK, Lenica and Petra, and we have a special guest as well, Irina, which Lenica will introduce shortly. As a reminder, the slides and recording will be available at the end of this week, um, and we will also post in the chat just to remind you as well. So I will now hand over to Lenica. Yeah, many thanks, Charlotte. And um, well, good morning to all of you uh, across Europe. And um, yeah, on behalf of Petra, Irina and myself, many thanks for joining, of course. Um, I'd first like to introduce Irina, who is our uh, external speaker, and I'm really excited she's joining us today. Uh, Irina is uh, SAP Sustainability Lead. Uh, responsible for commercial excellence uh, in that area uh, for the consumer goods business area. And she also has really uh, ample experience in trade marketing, uh, category management and sales, having previously worked at Coca-Cola and Unilever. Um, and Irina will also later on be providing really her point of view and experience in the challenges and opportunities in driving business sustainably. So uh, many thanks for joining us as well. So yeah, let's, um, yeah, welcome. Let's uh, crack onto the agenda. Um, well, in these times, which is really turning out to be, I would say, a perma crisis, uh, of, cor of course, first, um, we're going to focus on how concerns around sustainability might be shifting in these times of instability and really providing some context uh, of this time of age. Then secondly, we'll be looking at how uh, current circumstances are really turning uh, eco-actives a certain uh, direction when it comes to their purchasing and other actions making. Um, then uh, Irina will take some of these um, insights and really talk about how um, at SET they're working on implementing this in the day-to-day -day business. Um, and before sending you off, we will be talking about a rather peculiar, I would say, upcoming uh, motivation of um, behind eco-consciousness, which we call glamorously green, which we really see rising across the globe and also definitely in Europe. Uh, so we thought it might be quite important to share this with you as well before really synthesizing all of our insights into uh, what we see as the three drivers of transformation um, for the time uh, ahead. And then we will be stealing one or two minutes, of course, to tell a bit about how we can support you further on your sustainability journey. Uh, if time allows it, we'll have live Q&A. Uh, you can post all of your questions in the chat. Uh, if not, we will definitely follow up uh, via email uh, personally with you afterwards. Uh, so before we really get into the insights, uh, a bit on the sources we're using. Uh, so we're mainly uh, sourcing from two major publications. Uh, we have on sustainability, so who cares who does, and Green Gauge, uh, offering both a particular point of view on FMCG shoppers, plastic waste, and a more wider understanding of sustainability habits and concerns. And these publications are quite unparalleled really in their global coverage, amplitude, uh, and definitely also in trended insights, um, which uh, I'm, I'm, I'm quite, let's say, pleased with, because it really allows us to also mm, really contextualize the insights of this so um, unprecedented year, really, with, with the instability we're seeing, the high inflation rates, and really understand how we should look upon sustainability right now, but also which things really do persist uh, and, and will actually keep on going in, in the near future. So having said all of that, let's get started and I'll pass over to, uh, to Petra for the first part. Yeah, thank you, Len Lenike, and um, welcome from my side as well. So let's start and let's have a look how important is sustainability in times of instability and the current times of crisis and what's currently changing. So why do we talk about sustainability uh, now? Um, in addition to the classic product range or the needs that a product fulfills, it's getting increasingly important for consumers what 
values a brand represents and uh, how a brand behaves. So one third of global consumers will select one brand over another specifically because it supports a cause they believe in. And if you now think, yeah, one third of consumers, that's not even the majority, then please think about that we speak about 2 billion consumers worldwide. So this is really a lot. And these are especially those consumers who are more quality oriented and less price conscious. So especially a valuable target group for you. So, but which values are really important for the consumers and what's top of mind for them. And this is clearly sustainability. So according to 73% of global consumers, it's important that companies take environmentally responsible actions. And so sustainability will also determine the economic success of companies in the future. Um, we expect that the so-called eco-actives will spend more than $1,000 billion on FMCG and more than $700 billion on technical consumer goods globally by 2030. And environmental awareness has developed in the past years into a personal core values of consumers. This is something that we measure with our GFK Consumer Life Study. Um, in our G GFK Consumer Life Study, we do an annual um, survey of consumers all around the world for already uh, more than 25 years. And we measure and observe a shift towards looking beyond the self. Consumers are increasingly watching out for our planet and uh, values like preserving the environment or being in tune with nature are getting more important in nearly all countries of our study in the past years. And COVID was a catalyst for this increased environmental commitment. So 52% of consumers even stated that sustainability become or became more important to them due to the COVID-19 crisis. And we could observe this in their behavior. People spent more time in nature. They felt a close connection to nature. Uh, time gardening increased. And um, so, yeah, we definitely um, saw a effect of the pandemic and this effect is even going on currently. But now that we see that the importance of the COVID-19 pandemic is ebbing away slightly, there's already the next crisis that consumers are facing, and this is inflation. So worldwide, we see an inflation on average of, of 8%. Um, so in some countries, it's even higher. And the interesting question is, how do these rising cr uh, prices influence consumer concerns and their attitudes towards sustainability. And if you look on the slide on the uh, left hand side on the on the graphic, you can see how consumer concerns have been developed in the last years. And we see at first that inflation rocketed to the number one societal concern. So currently, uh, it's the main concern of the consumers. In Germany, for instance, 84% of consumers are worried about rising prices for energy. Um, if you have a look at, uh, at the concern about um, the climate change, then you can see that it peaked in 2020. It was the uh, number one concern in Europe in 2020. And then in 2021, the pandemic has pushed it down to the number three concern. And on this number three, it's currently stable. So it's a stable number three concern of consumers in Europe. And if you have a look at the red line on the slide, this is the concern about environmental pollution. And this is one concern that kept been in the, in the top five um, consumer concerns in the last years. So 
you can see that these concerns for the environment, concerns about climate change and pollution remain stable top worries of the consumers, even at, as other issues like the pandemic, for instance, come and go. And perhaps one figure in addition, it's uh, here in the uh, right hand side of the slide, um, three out of four consumers think that climate change is very or extremely serious issue. So who, what does it mean? Um, and who should really take over the responsibility for the environment? And this is the question that we ask to the consumers. And you can see here that only 50% of the consumers think that they personally can make a difference for the environment. And therefore, environmental protection uh, continues to be a table stakes for brand. 80% of consumers tell us that companies should care for the environment. And many companies are already taking their responsibility really seriously. And I could show you a lot of examples. I just picked two. So for instance, Burger King um, is um, has a new campaign with uh, meat substitutes. And uh, they, for instance, say, um, do you want the normal one or the one with meat? Yeah, so the normal one is the burger without meat. And that's showing that there's a, yeah, a shift going on. Um, so um, another brand that um, has managed to, to uh, really build up a very high level of trust um, in, in the past and currently, that's uh, Patagonia. So this is a brand that's really active in terms of uh, sustainability for already a long time. And they really managed with all their activities um, about uh, sustainability that consumers are really, yeah, build up trust into the brand. And this is indeed really important because we also see in our data that 60% of consumers are skeptical about environmental activities of brands. And um, they believe that companies are only interested in their profits and they suspect greenwashing. So it's increasingly important for, for companies and for brands to really the trust to be authentic, um, to convince com consumers that um, it's honest for them or they take it serious. Um, last but not least, sustainability will not only be getting more important for, for companies because consumers are expecting uh, sustainability. It's always also the case that the government um, will increase the pressure in companies. Just to give you one example, um, in the Dutch city of Harlem, public advertising for meat products is already banned. So it's not the situation that the tobacco industry is currently facing. It's not going that far. But nevertheless, you can see how quickly the, uh, the regulations can change and uh, yeah, make pressure on your, on your business model. So, but let's return to the uh, consumer and to the attitudes and uh, to their to their concerns. And what you can see here is that the cost of living crisis influences consumer attitudes um, about sustainability. Um, the main barrier of consumers to buy eco-friendly products is price. That has always been the case in the past. So 60% of consumers are telling us eco-friendly alternatives are too expensive. And um, even um, currently, the situation is, uh, yeah, is increasing. So 40% of consumers tell us they found it even harder to, ex to, to act sustainably because of the economic crisis. And therefore, we expect that the consumer habits will shift from buying to saving. But let's have a look what consumers are really doing in terms of the environment. And um, even before um, the current crisis and before rising inflation, consumers were most likely to do things 
that are good for the environment, but also good for their own budget and their own wallet. So 90% of European consumers conserve energy in the home and more than 80% conserve water in the home. And now consumers across Europe, um, but first and foremost consumers in the UK, in the Netherlands, and of course consumers with low incomes um, are most affected by the rising uh, costs for, for energy. Um, and it's not only these consumers that um, are affected, it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's affecting every, nearly everybody of us. So we expect that consumers will uh, try to reduce their energy consumption, water consumption, even more in the future to save, to save money. And it's also the general public that's called upon um, to save energy. Um, so, for instance, in Germany, we have an, a, a campaign from the from the government, um, which is focusing on social responsibility, calling on people to work together to reduce the consumption. And also, the manufacturers have taken this point and are focusing on solutions uh, to save energy and water. Um, a few weeks ago, we had the IFA and we saw a lot of innovations around these topics. So just to give you a few examples, we saw uh, water saving appliances. Um, we saw small thermostats that help consumers to take advantage of flexible energy tariffs. Um, we saw a lot of um, solar gadgets like the solar generator, um, you see the picture here, or for instance, Electrolux presented a dishwasher with an uh, eco-feedback, which informs you how eco-friendly the product, you, uh, the, the program you have chosen is. So a lot of innovation is going uh, on in this area of sustainability. But now that we have had a look at concerns, at attitudes of the consumers and the general behavior. The next interesting question is, how does the inflation affect um, the buying behavior of the consumers? And what all this, does all this mean for your business model and your future sales? And if you look at the consumer climate all around Europe, we see that consumer climate is declining, is dropping due to the exploding prices for energy. Um, this is just on the slide here, just an example for Germany. The development is nearly similar in all European countries. So uh, the willingness to make major purchases is on a, a historically low level. But how does it influence the purchasing intention for sustainable products? This is something we measure with our GFK sustainability index in Germany, in Italy, and in France. And um, we ask consumers, did you make a sustainable purchases in the past month? Do you plan to make a sustainable purchases? And are you willing to pay a higher price for sustainable products? And the interesting thing is that this uh, sustainability index is very stable despite the crisis. And even two thirds of consumers tell us that they are willing to pay a higher price for sustainable products, which means that sustainability also uh, offers uh, companies the opportunity to be successful even in times of crisis. And if we look at uh, the differences between um, the uh, purchase or the willingness to purchase between major purchases and FMCG products, um, then we can see a clear difference. So. 27% of consumers plan to buy major purchases sustainably in the future, um, but two thirds of consumers even plan to buy products for, for daily use sustainably in the future, which clearly shows that FMCG is the hotspot for turning concerns into action. And um, to better understand this, we will show you um, 
or give you more information in the next part of our presentation where we focus on FMCG products and a specific target group, the Ecoactives. So. Sorry, I was still muted. <laughs> Classic. <laughs> uh, so thank you a lot, uh, Petra. And um, as you said, am amidst these shifting concerns and quite frankly, I would say a, a more short term focus of uh, shoppers. Um, yeah, we do see shifts happening and it is for the first time since we are measuring our eco actives uh, after years of growth that we're actually detecting a decline uh, for the first time. Um, our eco actives some of you might know, some not, is our greenest segment of shoppers. They are uh, really intrinsically motivated to uh, take care of the environment and they make many actions really to reduce their waste. Um, and they also have a much wider set of actions they, they, uh, they undertake, but also really showcase their green behaviors in their purchasing, purchasing um, behavior. Now, this year, we end up with 21% of ecoactives across Europe. So that is one in five, but it does mean a drop from 26% last year. Now, the big question, of course, is do we think this is really uh, a trend that will continue or whether this is a temporary glitch? Um, well, I would definitely make the case that it is the latter. So surely uh, during COVID, we saw an acceleration of eco-activism uh, and now we're seeing, well, a bit of a, a downturn. However, even in the most pessimistic of forecasts where we would really think that 2022, <laughs> so is 2022 is really um, our predictive uh, year in that sense, we would still end up with one in four eco-actives uh, in, in just the course of five years. So um, that is a really considerable group uh, to take care of. However, um, it is, of course, uh, good to understand where this decline is coming from. Now, we might say there is a bit of plastic fatigue going on or rather perhaps distractions since the busy lifestyles are retaking and of course also the distractions of the cost of living crisis. So across the board and all the actions that are really defining what makes up an eco active uh, in our definition uh, that have to do with plastic avoidance. Uh, we see a decline in the frequency of all of them. However, it is especially uh, in an area outside of FMCG that, that this is, decline is the steepest. Um, so we see a 10% drop in the area of plastic toys, accessories, uh, but also in our focus area of FMCG, of course, um, we see a similar pattern. So avoiding plastic packaging or buying refills, uh, these are the, the most prominent behaviors that are in decline. Um, it is also true that the eco-actives are not exempt from the troubles and worries of the cost of living crisis. If anything, they even slightly state that they are more affected, struggling to make ends meet and find it harder to act sustainably. So um, there definitely is some pressure uh, on, them, uh, on them as well uh, because of these times well. However, there is many sustainable actions that are still really widely adopted. So Petra before already talked about recycling, conserving energy, which is really behaviors that are commonplace and widespread. So not only adopted by eco-actives, but also about uh, uh, adopted by our uh, considerers or uh, dismissers. Um, however, the behavior that is the most discriminating between the groups is really the purchasing part. So buying eco-friendly, um, as you can see, it's uh, on, on, almost on the bottom uh, of your slide. Um, this is really something that is driven by the eco-actives. So they are the ones that taking these concerns uh, and really turning it into actions in their homes, but also in their purchasing whenever they step into the supermarket. Um, and it is, of course, a fact that also the eco-actives 
encounter barriers and Petra also also mentioned the biggest barrier for all all shoppers is price and remains price so more than half are really set back uh, in purchasing uh, eco-friendly because of uh, their um, belief that uh, environmentally friendly alternatives are simply too expensive um, now another quite important barrier which is more applicable even to the eco-actives, and I found this quite surprising, uh, is the fact that they especially state that they would like to do more, uh, but they actually don't know how. So it is this group, our greenest group, that is in need of even more tools and help um, to, to act green. Um, I also would like to uh, draw your attention to the third biggest barrier, which is has to do with uh, the fact that a lot of shoppers believe that the eco-friendly alternatives don't work as well. Now, this is a barrier that is holding back the, the dismissers, so those that are not taking a lot of actions in their own homes to be eco-friendly, uh, even more so. But it also applies to the eco-actives. Um, and why is this so important? Well, because it's at the highest level it's ever been since we me started measuring in 2010. Uh, and it's made the biggest jump also since last year. So it's not just about price. It is really also about the belief uh, and the reassurance of product performance um, that uh, we should really keep an eye on uh, in the coming time. So all of this condensed in real market performance, we do see a deceleration of growth of, uh, let's say, green sustainable options. So in the past years, the COVID period, we really saw that these, this eco choice was outgrowing the market 30% um, higher than average. L lately, <laughs> we see a deceleration of this growth. Um, they're not underperforming uh, versus the market average either, um, but yeah, growth is stalling a bit. However, and for this, I would love, I, I always love to, to take a peek into uh, the German market, which is really Europe's greenest market. Um, there, I really do believe, and, and, and the, the market figures also show for it, that this trend will really return to growth uh, soon enough. So we have been tracking certain macro trends uh, for years now, and then you can really see that sustainability as a trend um, has been the one that has been growing in value the most uh, over the past few years, so 2019, 2020, 2021, uh, really uh, quite impressive numbers. Now, if we look in the middle, <laughs> uh, which was the early onset of this year, a sudden uh, instability, um, we see actually the sustainability trend declining slightly. However, the total market in Germany declined even more. So actually it did outperform the market in that sense. Then already a few months later, normalizing the situation, we again see this, this trend reverting to, to slight growth, where it, this doesn't hold, for example, for the lifestyle and premium trend that, that keeps declining. Um, however, what is really important, and we'll come back to this uh, later on as well, is that we see that it's especially the premium private labels that have been uh, keep uh, keeping growing um, and um, are really driving these trends nowadays. And uh, this again also becomes really uh, obvious when we look into the underlying product categories uh, in this uh, sustainability trend. You can see that in five out of seven uh, categories, it is A brands that are actually developing negatively and private labels that consistently uh, develop uh, really positively. So meaning <laughs> for me um, that the rules of growth would still apply uh, probably now even more than ever before. And that investment in brands, uh, counter cyclical is really key um, to well keep asserting your added value for money. Now, really condensing some meta learnings that we have when we look back years over hundreds of categories and tens of thousands of brands, we've come to some really incredible insights on what consumers think of brands in, in categories has a really strong effect on private label share. So meaning when shoppers really see and believe that brands 
advertise, offer good value for money, uh, there's high brand trust and see high innovation rates coming from brands that typically private label levels in those categories are about 25% lower. The opposite holds true when they don't hold this belief, then typically private label trend, uh, shares tend to be about 30 to even 40% higher. Also, private label share gains are likely to be much longer lasting. So penetration really remains key because the likelihood of brands actually reconquering lost shoppers uh, is much less for brands than it is for private labels. As private labels, when they gain share, they're much more likely to hold on to the share uh, in the years to come. Now, of course, added value and investing in brands is all about building brand identities that really resonate with shoppers. So looking at what has been really uh, been the most successful brands, uh, looking into the German market, for example, those brands that really outgrew the market uh, by far for consequent years, what really sets them apart is that beyond focusing on pure functionality, which we just saw is really important, especially in these times of high heat and price focus, they are really able to combine, I would say the responsabilization aspect, the focus on nature, but not from a deprivation point of view, but from an enabling point of view. You can have it all, you can have fun, you can keep up with your lifestyle, you can still indulge yourselves whilst being green. So it is the connection of these two um, aspects and this end end kind of uh, thinking that has really been driving, uh, driving uh, the success of brands. And this is this uh, glamour green uh, motivation that we'll be uh, addressing a bit later on as well. So added value for shoppers or, or in these times, even more important, what are they most willing uh, uh, to still uh, pay a premium for, uh, continues to be uh, natural. So natural ingredients or, or anything related to natural, sustainable, also in that sense, um, organic really are still major influences on um, on uh, people wanting to buy products that they either put on their body or that they eat and drink. Um, and second place, it is also still eco-packaging or eco-friendly production methods that in uh, con shopper mindset are uh, more worth of a premium than other products. So this is also quite, um, uh, I would say, important to, to understand in these times of hate and price focus. Now, when we look at what the products are that are actually being bought the most uh, at this moment, it is mainly locally produced uh, uh, fresh produce. It is products made from recycled plastic and personal care products with natural ingredients that shoppers really uh, buy often or at least regularly. Now, in the bottom end, we find products without microplastics or uh, products with reduced carbon footprint. Um, that shoppers are embracing, well, at a little bit slower pace. And this, in a lot of uh, cases, has a lot to do with the fact that shoppers are simply unaware. Uh, they have not encountered this. They, have, they, they don't know what these products are about. So there's still some work to be done uh, when it comes to the recognition and understanding of what these products offer. Uh, however, especially when it comes to carbon zero products, we see that this is a product choice that especially the eco-actives are already really uh, warming up towards. So in the coming years, this will really keep growing in importance. Now, plant-based is one of the categories which is, I would say, more black and white because there's 61% of shoppers that choose this frequently or occasionally, but it's also the category where uh, shoppers, most of shoppers say um, they uh, will, uh, do they don't intend buying it at all. So there's a bit of like a, a clash <laughs> between two groups here. The important um, takeaway for me is when you look at what's really driving these choices, and this actually also goes for 
choices such as natural or microplastic free that a lot of times the major driving is driver is that it's better for my health and then in a secondary place better for the environment and this also holds true for uh, plant-based so joining up benefits good for you good for the planet will actually improve your chances of resonating with shoppers uh, and to round off before i hand over to irina is uh just like to give some notes on on a few brands that really stand out in terms of performing well with ecoactive so the flower farm is a brand in uh in the netherlands in in this case in the butter uh, margarine category um that has shown really strong growth in terms of penetration especially among ecoactives and not only in reaching them but also in um spend per buyer so Ecoactive spent 100, uh, like 15% more actually on on the brand than average shoppers, and what this brand does quite well, it is okay. Okay, really um, joining up, I would say a lot of these eco choices that we're just seeing, but in terms of packaging and this quick choice that shoppers need to make in store, really focusing on one major uh, action or contribution. So it's quite clear for shoppers what their product choice actually entails. And quite boldly on the packaging, which in itself already stands out, it says smear without palm oil, bake without palm oil, as the major takeaway you get actually when you grab the product. So um, yeah, this is a, a good example of how keeping it simple <laughs> also for eco-actives uh, is uh, quite important. Then a second case um, is the brand uh, Danke, which for the non-German speakers <laughs> means thank you. And it says your small contribution. So again, how your small transaction in store can actually make you feel you're doing something good for yourself and for nature. So again, a lot of different uh, aspects on why the product would be uh, eco-friendly, but I'd like to turn your attention more to what it adds in terms of incrementality. Since, uh, for example, in a category like household tissue, we are actually seeing penetration falling for many years and eco-actives under trading even at an index of 90, so 10% less uh, than they should be spending on the category. Now, this brand has been really able to attract the Ecoactives back to the category. So when you look at the total assortment in the category, the brand really ranks in the top uh, three and four ranks uh, of SKUs that are adding exclusive buyers to the category, meaning um, if this product would not be there, the shoppers would not buy the category at all. So um, offering viable alternatives is really important, especially for these eco-actives that otherwise might opt out of categories that are under threat. So it's not a coincidence this brand is from, uh, this brand is from Essity, um, uh, uh, which really got us uh, thinking and, uh, and, and starting to talk uh, to Irina about the different facets of sustainability. And uh, I think this is a perfect moment for her to uh, expand on that. Yeah, thank you very much, Lianneke. And I have to say that, of course, I'm very, very happy to be with you today because, as we are always saying, insights are very important. But what is very important, how we are, as a company, how we are digesting them and how uh, we are doing the outcomes, how we are impl implementing the outcomes after. That's the very important. But, guys, uh, if you are still sitting and thinking what the SCT produce, produces, I would tell you, that uh, we are the company producing hygiene products. Uh, and even I wrote uh, down uh, some very famous brands that most probably you used already and you like. If you're living in France, for sure you're fully aware about, okay, Lotus and uh, what is the brand? Nana for Femcare. So if you're living in Germany, you're buying definitely Ziva or Tempo. Tempo. In UK, it's Kushel and uh, uh, also our to uh, important product, uh, what is it? Uh, body form, of course. So, uh, of course, uh, I would like to share with you what is the current situation sustainability related. In general, what I can say, of course, uh, this crisis and inflation hit us severely. Uh, energy crisis together with the raw materials price increases for a time being, of course, we are reviewing all our operations, all our product assortment, and we are trying to understand uh, 
how to survive and how to continue being on the markets. That's very, very challenging situation. And of course, we are asking very sustainability. Is it still a priority for the shoppers and consumers? Lenica, as you and Petra, as you mentioned, are they ready to pay? What to do with our sustainability launches that are coming? Of course, that's not easy because I have to say that the pattern is not stabilized. People are still reviewing their normal way of living. So let's see. Uh, sustainability, if you're talking about consumers, shoppers, and guys, retailers, and customers, if you're here, we're always discussing how to proceed to drive sustainability. But not very often we are concentrating on our own employees because in our organization, we face the challenge when our people, sales, customer, marketing, marketing, they said, guys, very sustainability is it deprioritized. We are talking pricing, profitability, inflation. Uh, are we supposed to drive sustainability? Is it still top of our priority? And that was, by the way, the real challenge internally. So how we overcame it? One important uh, hint for you. We organized every year, we are organizing the big event for the whole organization. We call it Sustainability Days. This year it happened in June and we decided that because of, uh, because of our people and their uncertainty, we really would like to make sure that our people understand that sustainability is important. It's still our top priority and we would continue driving this. So we organized three days for the whole organization. You see that every day, probably you can use this concept as well. Every day I had uh, the theme like day number one, Earth Day every day, meaning that we are driving sustainability every single day, not from promo to promo, but it's our strategy. Second day, Stronger Together, we invited our FMCG partners, Henkel, Danone. We also talked about our innovations when our category leaders were explaining how we are going to achieve net zero. Also, Lenica, you remember during day three that we called uh, Inside Hub, Lenica was presenting the insights, what is going on with the sustainability. It was very interesting. So fantastic uh, small themes that we have created for our organization and the outcome was really fantastic. So our people were happy to understand that uh, sustainability is still top of our priority and we would continue driving this. Happy to share if you would like uh, to know more about uh, this concept and how it was developed, of course. Okay, so and the next slide. Uh -huh, wrong button. Yes, the next slide. Of course, we wanted uh, to show you how we are working with the insights. You remember, Lenica, you said that Ecoactives this year, they declined because of the living crisis, that we know. But we are pretty sure that this group would grow again because people want to buy sustainable, sustainably in the future. So how we are working with Ecoactives? And please tell me in the chat if you uh, saw already on your market these fantastic innovations. Washable underwear, it's really they break through on the market in a way that we have to change the mindset of our consumers and shoppers. Washable underwear, what concept tells us? So women and men, by the way, as well, have to wear the product, wash it and wear again. And you see the impact on the environment on your screen. So fantastic launch for Ecoactives, but Ecoactives at the same time, we know that they're eager to try something new and they're eager to change the way of using the product. It's a very successful launch on the market and we are very happy with the sales. Very recent launch on the Nordic markets, hybrid diaper. Also very new concept where we have to change the way of thinking of parents. So how it works, out a part, the parents have washed, in the part they have to change. Somehow they have to combine two parts together. Again, we are working on the communication ready to make sure that parents understand the benefit for the environment and they're ready to, to take and use the new product, helping the environment. And you see a 35% less carbon footprint. Next insight. Um, if you're from FMCG or other companies, probably you've noticed that some categories are really suffering of uh, uh, shoppers or consumers who are quitting the categories, or they're thinking that, oh, oh my God, it's too much waste to use. 
and our HHT household towers category is on this part of the story. So people are thinking we are using uh, household towers, it's too much waste. So our uh, communication campaign, what one sheet does plenty, one sheet for less waste, is really addressing this issue. When we are saying that, guys, our product of such a good quality, then one sheet is enough to do the job, was also quite successfully implemented on UK market. Another insight, Lenik, I know that you like this example in particular. So eco-actives need tools to do more. Considers need tools to get started. So communication is our tool really to deliver the message to our people. And of course, of all FMCG players, we are all, all the time discussing that the simple, consistent communication is key. But here the challenge is really how to integrate sustainability into the product communication. And I know that my colleagues are listening now and I'm sure that they remember how many debates and discussions we had internally, how to integrate sustainability. What would be the right time? And the Lotus Sans Tube, our coolest product on French market, tells the story. So we really managed to integrate sustainability message into the product message. Let's see if we were successful. So tell me again in the chat if you think that it would work. It works. Uh -huh. Lotus Sands tube is the only toilet paper without a tube. That's 140 tubes saved per household per year. Lotus Sands Tube, a small gesture for less waste. One of my favorite examples, because it made me very happy that we as a company found a way to integrate sustainability. Okay, next uh, insight, attitudes towards environmental responsibility. You remember this value action gap barrier. People don't think they can make a difference. What we have done? Uh, on Nordic markets, we have done fantastic cross-category campaign and we call it our responsibility, your choice. So what does it mean? So we created the sustainable products with less environmental impact, but now it's a call to action for shoppers to buy our products and be more sustainable. It was very successful with a good uh, return on investment. Next example. Yeah. Uh, very proud. Uh, guys, if you are living in Germany, definitely you noticed already our wheat straw launch for Ziva brand. And uh, which barrier are we talking here? Barriers to acting more sustainable. One out of uh, one in four shoppers have doubts about eco -pro product functionality. And it's really true for us as well. So we launched wheat straw uh, product meaning that uh, wheat straw integrated into the paper. And we reinforced the fact that it's as soft as zipper. Let's see how the communication uh, works here as well. And you see, of course, uh, our package and our POSM materials, how we uh, delivered the message to the people. As soft as ziva, important. So we reinforced the message that a sustainable launch is as good as our super uh, quality product. It's amazing what you can do with straw. And because it regrows so quickly, it gives us a new way to care for the world around us. That's why Zeva tissue products are the first in Germany with straw. Zeva, care well, live well. Hope you like the campaign and in particular how the message was integrated, uh, reassuring consumers about the functionality of the product. Okay, so we discussed already the packaging. So packaging is very uh, important because it really influences the shopper behavior. And this, you see on the slide that for packaging, we have the very clear targets and we worked with the packaging, uh, trying to deliver the right messages to our shoppers. But also you see that it's not easy. We have many messages and we have to prioritize. 
But you see on your screen, on the left hand side, Lotus brand, we put, I think the package in itself is quite straightforward. We put this made in France, you remember the inside, that people are eager to pay uh, for the products that are produced locally. CO2 reduced packaging and recyclable packaging. That's exactly what generates purchase intent. And of course, our message for our launch that no colorants, no allergens. On the personal care side, you see also, uh, we decided to put CO2 reduced packaging and we hope that people would read it and understand the main sustainability benefit of the product. And of course, Lenica asked me if you are working with other companies, if you are working with the retailers and how we are doing this. And of course we do, because nowadays we understand that it's not possible to drive sustainability if you are on your own. That's why uh, we are driving sustainability together with our de dear retailers and customers. If you hear me, thank you very much for the positive cooperation. And I put some examples for our French customer system, we developed the range of the paper package product, really helping system to drive sustainability agenda and to offer shoppers a sustainable offer. Uh, Carrefour, we are also driving partnership cooperation together and SCT is part of food transition pact. But not, also, not only customers retailers, but we are working with our consumers and shoppers. For example, you remember the example of the hybrid launch that I provided. So we worked together with our consumers and we worked out what would be the best concept for the parents for this hybrid diaper. Of course, uh, on, in, on French market, we are cooperating with Red Cross and we have done fantastic campaigns with Ocean and Casino. And Tesco, you see, we were saving koalas, uh, helping uh, the nature. I think from my side, that's it. Hope you find interesting the examples that I provided. And again, it's important how we use the insights in the organization. Thank you very much. Many thanks, Irina. Um, really interesting from a especially product point of view, how you have been uh, uh, pushing the agenda uh, forward. Also, uh, sometimes making bold choices. Uh, that I know have caused uh, 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 sometimes even discussion, uh, of course, inside uh, the organization. Um, and it's really good to see uh, that in spite of all the discussions these times, of course, being lots focused on price, um, that this does not mean that sustainability is off the agenda. It's rather about reinventing uh, direction. So with that, um, thank you, Irina. And we'll uh, move on to our final part, which is on the glamorously green um, inside. So, so far we have been talking about the eco-actives, uh, temporary decline, but still uh, quite a sizable group and definitely will regain uh, strength towards the future again. Uh, we've also been talking about shifting behaviors in terms of saving money and that you're almost like being green in the slipstream by accident as a as a second stream or, or strand of, of transformation that is happening when it comes to uh, eco uh, activation or behavior change. But there's also a third one that is, and we've hinted on this before as well, it's on this group of shoppers that does not want to sacrifice their maybe luxuries or their convenience, but they still really uh, are appealed by the green lifestyle. And um, Petra will uh, highlight a bit of this. Yes, thank you. Yeah, we've seen that um, sustainability is no longer a niche, but it has arrived in the mainstream. And because not all consumers are ticking in the same way, um, it's important to really understand the mindset of the consumers and the differences between specific target groups. And to help you to understand these differences, we have developed a segmentation, which is called a GFK Green Gauge Segmentation, and it classifies consumers based on their wider concerns about the environment, based on their attitudes and their behaviors. And uh, so we identified five different types of consumers. Uh, three of them you can see here on the slide. and. Um, 
What is interesting is how are these different target groups developing? And you see here that the uh, group of consumers that's skeptical or cynical about the environment, we call these the jaded, that's declining. Um, so these are consumers that make their purchase decisions rather based on cost and convenience. And so um, environmental impact is not that important for them. The greenest segment in our segmentation, that's called the green indeed. And uh, here we have a big overlap to the eco-active consumers that we spoke about. Um, you can see here that this segment declined currently this year in size by 5%. So these are really the people um, yeah, that um, are really active, they conserve energy, water, they recycle and they purchase uh, sustainable. Um, but what's even more important is that we see a strong growth in a segment that we call the glamour green. Um, this segment is growing by 15 percent points. So the interesting question is who are these glamour greens and the glamour greens um, for uh, is a segment or these are people um, for who um, yeah green is a badge of honor or a status symbol and they are really eager to showcase their eco-friendly behavior and their purchases so for instance they wear these statement t-shirts or they post their sustainable lifestyle in social media and they prefer products which allow them to combine eco-friendliness and status. And for these glamour greens, eco no longer means, uh, yeah, shapeless clothes or tasteless food, but they are really um, expecting a new coolness yeah, from the products. Um, and um, they expect that products are fitting to their lifestyle. It's a really hedonistic target group. They want to have fun and they expect that, um, yeah, product offers are, yeah, taking up their lifestyle. And one thing that's, which is interesting in addition, that's a target group uh, that has a more holistic view on sustainable. It's not only about the environment, it's they also care about the social aspects um, of, uh, of how a brand or a company behaves. Yes, definitely. And um, it's good to say that uh, when it comes to shopping, um, around one in five or 18 percent of European shoppers uh, showcase the habits and the behaviors of the Glamour Green. So it's a super sizable target group together accounting for 72 billion euros in FMCG in, well, only seven countries uh, already uh, and 3.1 billion uh, trips in a year. So a huge amount of uh, um, uh, possible touch points you have with them. Uh, it's higher in countries like Slovakia, Poland, and the Glamour Greens are a bit less uh, presented in countries like the Netherlands and uh, Belgium. Now, they have really uh, distinguishable shopping preferences, very much into brands. Branded products are better for them than no-name products, um, much more open to innovations. Uh, and, well, as the name suggests, they love to buy things that no one else has. So from a branding perspective, they're a quite important target group. However, they are also really addicted to convenience and they're also willing to pay more if it saves them time. And they can really not imagine doing without uh, any convenience products. Now, coming then to prices and quality, they're not so much about um, price, but they are um, uh, very much into quality seals, sustainability seals, of course, also to kind of showcase like look, I'm buying the right products, um, but they're also attentive shoppers uh, paying attention to information on packaging and, uh, for example, nutritional information. Uh, also in their product choices, you can really tell uh, their particular behavior. So they are not the ones that are avoiding plastic at home or making all these efforts, um, I would say intrinsically motivated, but they are a very big target group for um, 
specific trends that have everything to do with combating climate change and social aspects of ESG. So they have a wider understanding of responsibility than, for example, the eco-actives or green indeeds do. So plant-based, carbon footprint uh, reduction, uh, microplastics uh, are uh, really uh, appealing for this group. They have the highest incidence of veganism and vegetarian vegetarianism. Um, but they will not go out of their way to sacrifice convenience at all. Um, and then this would be our final uh, insight on the Glamour Greens for today is that they are quite particular in their shopping habits or erratic, you might say. So where you look at the, the eco actives and their top brands that are really uh, standing out for them, you would see all kinds of usual suspect green brands. For the Glamour Greens, this is not the case. It's really a mixture of all types of lifestyle brands, convenience brands, but also plant-based uh brands for example so um the way to the glamour greens is not only by talking about green or eco or natural it's about actually um offering green as as almost a secondary badge of honor so um with this in conclusion i would say there's really three drivers of transformation um, we're running just a few minutes over time, but I think uh, we'll round off soon enough. Um, but just to synthesize what we have been talking about is that there is a still really strong group uh, with intrinsic motivation, our eco actives that do for the sake of doing, and it goes without saying. So it's not about showing off it, it's about with every single choice you're making, you can make a difference, but they are looking um, for increased eco-feedback, increased ways of being green, um, and also by rewarding them for their loyalties. Of course, in these days uh, of um, brand switching, quite important. Um, reiterating product performance, uh, also really key to keep them satisfied. Uh, and uh, packaging is still the key differentiator um, in communicating with them, it's really about transformational communication and empowering uh, these shoppers. So let's do this together rather than, hey, look at us as a company having done all these good things. Then the second, uh, I would say, driver of uh, green behaviors is the one that is actually not green for the sake of being green, but for the sake of saving money. But there is a huge opportunity here if you will help shoppers, uh, for example, curbing food waste via portioning, um, uh, talking about expiration dates and optimal usage and, and, and storage. Um, also preparation that, for example, requires less energy of less equipment would all, of course, be really uh, um, interesting uh, for shoppers that are struggling. And there's loads of them right now. Um, Promotion strategy, also something to think about. Single price offs might uh, tick this group more uh, because it doesn't force them to buy more than they need. Uh, and it's really important to keep investing in brands to reassert brand added value over uh, for money. Then the third group, finally, it's this group we were just talking about that don't want to go without and that have the end end mindset. And for them, packaging and ads are really about showing off the goodness for themselves, but also for the planet. And it's about messages of your being worth it and facilitating really the guilt free uh, cheating. However, uh, it's about really marrying uh, convenience and eco-consciousness. So e-convenience or fast goods, so green made easy and the easy made green uh, is really the, the sweet spot for this, this group. Um, rounding off, uh, Petra has a, a, a small note on how we can help you further. Yes, and we definitely can help you further because we have a lot of more information about sustainability than we could present you in this one hour. So we have um, reports that are rather focusing on sustainability content.
concerns and the context and understanding the importance of sustainability in different parts of the world and different countries. We also have reports explaining more in detail how different target groups are are uh, differing, how they are thinking, what's important for them in terms of sustainability and how they should be addressed. And we also have a lot of information about the purchasing decisions that these consumers are making to really understand which brands are they buying, where are they ba- buying. And this helps you to, yeah, to, to build your strategy for your brand in your market. So just contact us if you have more questions, if you need more information. Um, we run over time currently, so I think we can't answer any questions right now, but you uh, posted some questions in the chat box, uh, in the chat box, and we pick it up later on and uh, yeah, contact you via, via email. <laughs> Yeah, there's a lot of questions uh, coming in, so uh, either directed to uh, Irina or Petra and me, so we will follow up via email directly one-on-one with you. So uh, the chat box is working, (laughs) because I saw a comment on that, Uh, but we will follow up uh, one-on-one. So for now, um, many, many thanks for uh, for your time, and uh, hopefully you enjoyed uh, the insights, and we look forward to continuing the the discussion discussions with you on how to drive your sustainability agenda. So on behalf of Petra, Irina and myself, have a lovely day and speak to you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.